afternoon program started. My name is Joe McLarnan. I'm a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and co-founder of M Health at Duke. It's very gratifying to uh, see the M Health at Duke conference still going strong in its fourth year. Um, I will be uh, moderating, emceeing, announcing our afternoon panel discussion entitled Methods for Improving Population-Based Studies. Here's the way we're going to do this. We have uh, three groups of speakers. Uh, we'll give each of them uh, 10 or 15 minutes to talk about uh, their program of research. We'll hold questions. And then uh, at the end, we should have about 15 to 20 minutes left um, where you guys can ask uh, whatever questions you have. Um, and I've talked to the panel members. We want the questions to focus um, as much on the actual work they're doing, and, um, but also about the process and the challenges associated with, with doing this kind of uh, research. So our first two speakers are Bernard Femmler and Eric, not Erica, sorry. I can't remember things without notes. Um, yeah, Erica Levine. Oh. All right. Maybe I shouldn't have given up caffeine for uh, a New Year's resolution. Um, okay. So uh, Bernard is associate professor in the departments of community and family medicine, psychology and neuroscience, and uh, also psychiatry and behavioral sciences here at Duke University School of Medicine. Co-founder and director of M Health at Duke. This program of research takes a lifespan approach towards understanding the determinants contributing to child and adolescent health behaviors, ultimately to adult chronic disease, as well as seeks to develop innovative intervention strategies, including mobile health strategies, um, to uh, promote health in children, adolescents, and their families. Uh, he will be co-presenting with Erica. Erica Levine is the program's director at the Duke Global Digital Health Science Center and lead coordinator of M Health at Duke. Erica coordinates the center's projects and programs. She works closely with Duke faculty and software en engineers to manage the development and evaluation of digital health interventions. Um, she's worn a lot of hats throughout her career. She's been an intervention coordinator, health educator, product director, and a project manager. And I'm sure that there are others. Uh, all right, so um, Bernard and Erica. Okay, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what we call prompt and a couple of different use cases that of, of prompt. And essentially, prompt is an automated interactive self monitoring and data integration engine designed to engage research participants in behavioral change and promote retention in research studies. So, one of the things that one other hat that I wear is, is, is work with uh, epidemiology. And we are following a cohort of, of children who were born to mothers that were recruited between 2005 and 2011. We're trying to follow up these children and learn about neurodevelopment and self-regulation and obesity and how some of the prenatal exposures like nicotine or pre-pregnancy obesity might impact the development of these outcomes in children. And we're able to look at some unique uh, characteristics like using some of the cord blood to look at epigenetics uh, and inflammation to look at sort of the biological mechanisms that might mediate some of these associations. So I want to tell you a little bit how Nest got started. It was basically two R01s, and it wasn't my R01s, somebody else's R01s, who's at NC State now, actually. And uh, she started the cohort uh, with two R01s and an R21. So it's a very expensive endeavor, and there was also some money that was, you know, part of startup funds or part of uh, internal funds that were used to, to develop this cohort. 2000, over 2,000 women, 2,500 women were recruited uh, into this cohort. So it's a very, very expensive study. When the R01s were over, we started planning follow-up studies where we wanted to follow the children. And we... Um, 
we really didn't want to lose them. I mean, we've invested so much in this cohort, we wanted to be able to maintain contact with them, even if we had some lapse of funding or in periods where uh, it was difficult for us to have the full staff available to keep tracking them. And so we, uh, so I put in an internal grant uh, to, to help uh, establish this prompt platform, cohort management platform, which I'm not sure exactly what we call it, but it, it's cohort management with prompt or something like that. It's basically an endeavor that, that we help, we work with Gary Bennett's group to, to help uh, build out this use case for this, for this particular purpose. But you know, in, in epidemiology, we currently use things like phone calls, newsletters, birthday cards, Mother's Day cards, and these are helpful because we can send them a birthday card, and if we, don't, if we get it back saying the address has changed, we know that we need to start looking in their health records to find their address. But it's very time intensive. We have lots of staff you know, just dedicated towards doing this recruitment. And you know, we're following, we're trying to recruit uh, you know, 700 kids in this, from this cohort. And you know, from this cohort, we're reaching out to 2,000. So it's very, very uh, challenging. So the, the problem is that you know, these traditional methods are, are very time consuming and they're staff intensive. And really, you know, they're not optimal for busy families. Like when we're trying to say, hey, would you like to join our study? We're calling at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when the family's just getting home. You know, they don't want to have to deal with a phone call from a research participant. You know, we're, but, but our staff leaves at 4.35 and we need to make sure that they have time with their family. So this is very challenging to make sure you know, we're getting our messages across. Um, and it's really not op optimal to capture data in the field. I mean, we can send a, a questionnaire home and say, can you fill this out over the course of the week and send it back to us. Um, but you know, the, the data loss there is pretty large and nobody sends those forms back. So um, what we wanted to do is, was build a platform or build a way that we can uh, promote retention and inc increase engagement over time in these prospective studies. We also wanted to be able to survey uh, participants intermittently. You know, we're following these kids over the ages of from four to seven years of age, uh, so we're following them for five or seven, five or six years, and we want to be able to, to follow them. What we d did with the help of Gary's group because they were simultaneously also doing something very similar, and Eric is going to talk about how they're using Prompt. But essentially, what we wanted, we, what we did is we, use, we we already have a lot of data on these participants. We know when their children's birthday is. We know when um, we know when we're scheduling them for a follow-up visit. We know a lot of information already. So we have this back-end data data set that we built the prompt engine to be able to read that data and then send out messages that uh, we crafted that would help build out retention of the cohort. So things that we normally do, and we still do these by paper mail, but we send you know, postcards or email, um, sorry, emails, postcards, and then birthday cards. And we wanted to be able to send them a birthday wish via text, for example. Or did you get our birthday uh, card in the mail? Yes, no so that we could get a faster response to say, oh no, I didn't get that. Oh, well, we must have the wrong address. We'll try to look that up and send you a new one. So it's very interactive in the sense that they can receive a voice or text message asking them about um, an activity. They can respond, and then we have that data to understand what we need to do on our end. So it runs off of calendars, so it'll send off messages based on certain calendars, appointment times, Mother's Day, Christmas, holiday cards those kinds of things. And then um, it, it also captures data. So, so here's an example. The participants can choose if they want to receive a text message. Uh, we have a, one of the follow-up studies is called Thriving. And, it's a, and so they might receive a text message that says, what time did Stephen fall asleep last night? Please answer using a 12-hour format, like 7.30 or 7.30 or 7.30. And they say, well, 8 o'clock. Thanks. Next question. How restful do you think your child's sleep was on a scale from one to five? One is not very restful. And five is very, very restful. Five. Wonderful. Thank you so much and have a great day. So we can send out this text message over the course of one week while we're also collecting their physical activity data and we're quickly tracking their sleep patterns of their child. And, you know, we, this is, if you study sleep in children, 
It's very hard to capture sleep in children with actographs in and of itself. It takes some reporter as well. So this allows an extra layer of data. And here's an example of the, auto, the voice messaging system. Hello, I'm calling from Friday. It's Erica. Is this Sarah? Please press one for yes or two for no. About a week ago, we sent you and Jane an invitation to a party for Friday. We hope you can join us. The party is April 23rd at 3 p.m. at Applebee's. Can you come? Press 1 for yes, or 2 for no, or 3 for maybe. So you get it, right? So, you know, we are able to get this information back, um, and we know what they're coming. Um, and what's nice about this, too, is if, if there is a way where they haven't received a message from our team, um, it will send them to a real life um, study coordinator. So if, for example, uh, they indicate that they, that they can't make their appointment, well, that can be sent back to uh, someone live who can answer the phone and say, okay, I, I understand you can't make your appointment, let's find another time. So it's using in intelligent systems and, and automated systems to help us carry out some of the tasks. And I'll let Erica now talk a little bit about the ones, how she's using it for behavior change. Hi. So first, before I begin, I just want to thank um, our software engineer, Martin Stryker, who's in this room today. Um, he's been invaluable in helping us design the system, um, and um, Gary Bennett, obviously, for just sort of spearheading the whole thing and really helping us frame all of this. Um, so, okay, so first I want to start with why we want to automate some of these things. Um, we know that self-monitoring works to help people change their behavior. We know that it works for things like diet pattern improvement, physical activity improvement, um, medication adherence, all sorts of different behavior change. Um, we also know that, um, that commercially available products that are now on the market are really easy to use, right? So self-monitoring on paper is really hard, but wearing um, a Fitbit um, or sort of just getting notifications throughout the day is easy. So what we wanted to do was sort of combine these things, this is a very busy slide, um, but we sort of wanted to combine the best of the commercially available apps, the ability to be passive, to be on almost all the time, um, and to just be easy and sort of look cool and give you cool vibrations on your wrist and stuff, um, and combine it sort of and make it smarter, right? Make it more evidence-based and sort of integrate evidence more into these commercially available apps, which are really pretty, um, really seamless, and have a lot of power that we're not harnessing yet. So what we can do is we can ask a participant to wear a Fitbit or log their calories. We can um, then by their participant specific calendar, we can say, are they supposed to get a message yet? And if so, what should that message say? So what that message says is gonna be different based on the algorithms that we apply to those data coming in, based on the responses that we've sort of um, in certain cases pre-written to say if they're doing well, if they're doing better, if they're not doing as well. Um, and then we can also generate reports from this system. Um, and we can do this via uh, a landline, anywhere from a landline to like the fanciest smartphone, even an Apple Watch, I suppose. Um, and we can also integrate the data that are coming in, these data that are coming in from the participant. Um, we can integrate those you know, sort of send messages to participants, but also loop in research assistants, health coaches, um, and even researchers. Um, so we've already seen the first use case, um, I can step pilot. Um, and so just very quickly again, we get data from Fitbit every single day. Every day this prompt engine will ask, did the participant meet their step goal? Did the participant improve over yesterday, over the past week? Um, and does this participant need a new goal? And that's all driven by these algorithms and by the calendar that's set up specifically for the participant. Um, and then you can see we can put together a message um, automatically and then send it out via a service called Twilio. The second um, use case, there's a poster actually outside if you want to learn more about that, um, but this sort of adds a layer of logic where we want to integrate incentives and ask if a participant, based on how they're using a cellular connected scale um, and a 
my Fitness Pal app, how they're doing that week, and also what is the incentive for the week that they're in, and did they qualify for that incentive? Um, and then again, we put together a message um, and we tell them if they won, how much they won, um, and give them a reminder to do it the next week. And we do this legitimately all in an automated fashion. So a human doesn't have to go in and type out the message. We don't have to send the message from our cell phones or from Google Voice. It just all happens. And we can have a record of those messages in a, um, in a dashboard. And the way that Prompt is organized, um, so Bernard staff sees Bernard's organization and the studies that are in Bernard's organization. Um, I'll see the studies that are in my organization that I'm assigned to see. A research assistant, same way. So we sort of um, divvy up pr uh, permissions based on where we are. Um, and then there's also, oops, sorry. There's also, um, this is really sort of the biggest one. I apologize for the for the slide, but I'll just walk you through it. Um, there is also sort of a way for us to text message or send people automated phone calls, like the one that you heard, to ask them to self-monitor. And this is really where Prompt came from. It's the, it's the fact that we know that engaging people in self-monitoring helps them to do it longer, making it simple, helps them do it for longer, and that will promote weight loss um, and weight gain prevention, and smoking cessation, and medication adherence, and physical activity promotion. Um, the interactive obesity treatment approach, as you can probably guess from the name, is more about weight loss and weight gain prevention than anything else. So what we do is we, um, we send people a survey. They fill out that survey. It's all about their behaviors. How many days a week do they drink sugary drinks? How many days a week do they get 10,000 steps? Those sorts of things. Then we can um, rank those behaviors and decide how many to give them at one time. So one person will get no sugary drinks and don't, don't eat fast food. Another person might get eat more fruits and vegetables. And then we can either text them or call them every week or every day. Um, we can give them, they track via either their keypad or um, just by texting us back. And then we send them um, immediate tailored feedback right there and then it's done. It's a 30 second interaction to a two minute interaction. Um, they've done their self monitoring for the week. Um, and if you look up Dr. Bennett's research, um, you'll see that we've gotten some pretty good results um, in the past. And so what we wanted to do though was answer some basic questions about how frequently do people really want to self monitor and how frequently does self monitoring work? Do people have to do it every day or can they do it once a week? Can they do it three times a week? Do they, will they interact with us more if we send them random text messages asking them or if we stick to a very defined schedule? What if we set the schedule versus them setting the schedule? There are all these questions that sort of hang out in our heads about engagement and how we really improve engagement in interventions, but we don't have the manpower to manage all of those different aspects of those studies. And with Prompt, our hope is and our plan is to sort of randomize people to get all these different conditions um, and then to, to see which ones work. That's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Erica and Bernard. It's okay to clap. Uh, Erica, actually, can you cue up yeah. the next? Uh, yes, okay. So our next speaker is Dr. Ryan Shaw. Uh, Ryan is an assistant professor in the School of Nursing uh, with interdisciplinary training in nursing health Health Informatics and Computer Science. He's affiliated with the Duke Center for Health Informatics and has a secondary appointment in the Center for Health Services Research in primary care at the Durham VA. His research interests are on the use of novel technologies to help clinicians manage and patients self-manage multiple chronic uh, illnesses. Ryan. All right, thanks, Jeff. So I'm just going to briefly uh, present to you on two different software applications to be able to do um, a population-based health, um, health really, um, research. The um, first one is a um, homegrown um, software application. I'm going to really um, walk you through. And then I'm going to um, talk to you about a new um, research kit app that we just launched. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, walk you through this slide. Um, uh, this is just an illustration, in, in part it's a, a data flow diagram 
um, about our um, software and how we really um, collect this data from our um, patients. So in this bottom right hand um, corner, we have a we have a, um, a patient that we might recruit from an outpatient um, clinic who has multiple um, chronic um, illnesses. They are likely to have a, um, a smartphone. They don't have to. Um, but we can um, tether different um, devices that they might use to self-monitor um, health, and it, and it can um, tether to their um, phone. Or if it's a, um, a cellular-enabled um, connection, um, it doesn't have to sync to a phone. But in, but in this case, um, they are, um, this per person can track um, they're per, um, they can track, um, they, they can track um, weight, they can track um, blood pressure, also they can track um, glucose and so forth. And that data from those um, devices um, it might go into a phone and then it goes to a, it goes to a, um, a third party um, a platform, like say um, Fitbit or even um, iHealth, um, which is another um, consumer um, suite that you can buy at Best Buy. And that data comes back onto the, onto the, onto the um, left side here. It goes into our um, mobile health um, a platform where we magically analyze it. Actually, it's pretty um, complicated. Um, and then uh, we can send that um, data out to a um, clinician or we can send it directly to a patient also. Um, and there are multiple ways that really uh, we can do that. Um, what I specifically uh, wanted to point out is that it's really important to understand that in order for us to get this data from these third-party um, tools, we have to go through an API, which is the um, application program um, interface. It might sound easy, but you really have to look at each suite of tools because different um, companies have different rules. You can't always pull out data, and you might get different kinds of data um, depending on what that suite is. So if you want to move forward in this um, space, um, it's not necessarily as easy as it often sounds. So I'm just going to briefly um, show you what a system like this looks like um, from a, um, a research standpoint. Um, oh, I actually forgot that there is really another slide here. Um, the overall goal is that we have a, um, a patient who has different types of um, devices. We can collect um, data. We have automated computer algorithms that can send that a message back to them or to a, a provider. And really, when we think about it from a population health standpoint, it's not likely to go to a, um, a physician first because um, you don't really have time to you know, uh, monitor all these uh, people, but it's likely to go up through a chain of um, you know, um, command um, where it might go to a, um, a patient tech or an IT um, analyst, up to a nurse, and then on to other uh, providers. So just kind of a, um, a um, conceptual idea of how we might actually uh, manage um, uh, populations um, using these tools. So I'm going to do this pretty quick, quickly. So for example, our um, system uh, looks like this. We can have um, patients who enroll in a um, trial. I have all these uh, boxes here because I'm not going to show you um, a PHI. Um, but we can enroll people there. We can, so um, this is just a me here. And you can see how I enrolled myself in various um, Fitbit um, tools and also iHealth tools. So uh, this is where you have to give a permission to integrate with an API for that respective um, company. Um, so your um, user or your um, a patient has to give us, you know, a permission with their a login of credentials. Um, we can also send out scheduled text messages, which is fairly um, similar to what they talked about using um, a prompt. And we can um, schedule those out using a calendar, um, just like where we have a list of um, patients. And that can go out over up to um, 24 months. Um, this is just an example of what the actual data looks like when it comes back. Um, this is me, and I don't care if you see my um, Fitbit um, data. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't come back all um, beautiful here. It's actually kind of a data dump, so you get lots of data. And when I say you get lots of data, um, you get lots of data. And I'm not going to walk you through this. This is just kind of, I just want to emphasize this, that this data is already um, collapsed by each week, and this is just only six people. So uh, just be mindful that when you move into this space, there's a, lar there's a large um, analytics um, portion that comes part with this, and it's something that you want to prepare from the very uh, beginning. Um, the other thing I want to talk to you is about a new um, study where we are using Apple's um, research kit to do a, um, a population-wide um, study across the entire um, US. 
Um, this is the sixth um, vital sign. Um, this was funded by um, DCRI, um, and I'm going to show you our um, website in just a bit. And if you aren't familiar with Apple's uh, research kit platform, um, what this allows us uh, to do is you can literally put an app on the um, iTunes store, you can download it, and you can um, consent right on your phone. You don't have to meet with anybody. Um, we do provide an email address um, and also a, um, a phone number to call pe people, but you can download the app on your phone. Um, and you can uh, participate in a study, uh, you know, um, right there. And the idea is that this type of um, population-wide um, research, we can get access to people all over the entire um, country and eventually over the entire uh, world. So um, this is Duke's second uh, second uh, research kit um, study. Um, uh, the first one is called Autism and Beyond. Um, uh, this one happens to be um, where we are um, examining how we can collect. Uh, how we can collect um, walking speed via people's um, cell phones to be able to understand new standards by specific um, populations in terms of uh, what is the normal um, walking speed. And eventually something like this could hopefully be used in a clinic too. Um, hopefully this will pop up. Yay. So um, if you guys are um, interested in checking this out more, you can go to our um, website, which is sixvitalsign.researchkit.duke.edu, and you can literally download this right onto your um, phone. It looks like this here. Um, I'm just going to scroll down to show you a few um, screenshots. So you can um, consent on the phone, and then you answer a few, um, a few um, questions, and then you do a brief um, walking test and then you answer some more um, questions after that. So um, if you'd be interested in um, participating in a, um, a population-wide um, research study, um, if you're able to use um, Research Kit, it is a um, really good tool to um, do this. I would say that Duke is still um, working out um, the overall um, platform to make it easy for um, researchers to do, um, but uh, this is uh, one of the next um, generations for doing this type of research. All right, thank you. Thanks, Ryan. All right. Uh, our final speaker in this uh, session is Dr. Zach Rosenthal. Uh, I just learned that Dr. Rosenthal has recently been promoted to associate professor with tenure. Congratulations, Zach. Uh, he is, uh, has joint appointments in the Duke University Medical Center Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and also in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience. He wears uh, so many hats. Um, which ones do we think are the most important? Um, he's, he is a uh, program director of the Clinical Psychology Fellowship Program um, and also vice chair for clinical services in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences um, and director of the Sensory Processing and Emotion Regulation Program. Uh, Zach's line of research is focused on characterizing problems with emotional functioning and emotion regulation in adult psychopathology in both um, in general and borderline personality disorder specifically. Recent years, he's extended to the development of novel computer-based interventions for treatment-resistant populations. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, guys, for having me. Thanks for being here. I'm going to talk about something really uh, quite different, I think, than the last couple talks. Although, in some ways, I'm going to talk about something similar. I'm going to talk about props, but not prompt. I'll, t I'll talk about their platform, uh, a, really, a really different way of thinking about prompting. Now, the world that I'm coming from is a world where I'm, I'm a psychologist doing research and doing clinical work, and my objective is to try to help people change behavior in the real world. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a very different way of thinking uh, than you've heard in the first few minutes. I have no, I have many conflicts, but I don't have any conflicts of interest associated with this presentation. And I wanted to just begin by thanking the many, many, many people who are involved in this, uh, this study that I'll talk about. So in my world, again, the sort of the thing I think about is really the Achilles heel of all behavioral therapies for all psychological or psychiatric problems that have ever existed is how do we help people translate or generalize change from where they learn in the clinic to where it matters outside of the clinic. Okay, so this talk is going to be about generalization of learning as a basic human and really animal phenomenon that we don't quite understand well enough uh, to really develop optimal treatments to help all sorts of people change day to day in their real life. 
So I'll do this quickly. So just kind of framing it, since I, I'm guessing we have a, a very diverse crowd here in terms of backgrounds. In, uh, in the world of, of psychiatry and psychology and social work and outpatient treatment for mental health problems, even the very best treatments for many of our problems don't work very well. Right? So starting with that perspective, that we have evidence-based, really good interventions that can help people improve, but even the best benefit our worst the least, if you will. Right? So the more severe you are, the more likely you are to continue to struggle after the best treatment. Uh, and one of the problems with this is that I can train people in my clinic and I can probably, I can train all of you in this spot if we needed to and we wanted to, to have a particular response. But it doesn't really matter if when you leave this training context, you go out into the real world and, you're, and you have different kinds of associations that are, you're confronted with, different people and places and things and triggers and cues and so on. So what we might call condition responses occur uh, with problem behaviors in high-risk contexts. Uh, but yet the paradox is we do treatment all over the place in these very sterile artificial environments that are really nothing like the real condition cues of the real world. So that's, that's sort of the, the backdrop for, for this talk. Uh, and the idea is to really use uh, mobile platforms and to wed mobile platforms with uh, learning models, basic learning models derived from animal learning science to try to wed them together to create something that is different than we currently do. And one model that uh, we've been working with is, uh, was developed um, really in the lab by animal researchers, including uh, this citation here. Uh, Mark Boughton is, is one of the kind of the, the people who you would look to in the field that really has led developing this. The idea is that you can extinguish a response in a training context. And when you extinguish that response, as soon as you extinguish it, you can provide a reminder of that learning by pairing pairing that reminder with the extinction response. So now you create some sort of new learning process. You essentially engineer learning by pairing, say, a, a novel and neutral stimulus. You pair that with this in-the-moment, real-time context of learning. And then what you do is subsequently present that reminder, which we're calling an extinction reminder here. You present that reminder in a different non-training context in the real world and you present it at just the right time, and the model that has been shown in animal science is that you can get, you can get this generalization of learning to occur by prompting. Right? This is how do you use prompts effectively. And so we can call that, uh, we can think of this uh, as a condition inhibitor in a way that the, the stimulus could inhibit typical responses in the real world. So we've been developing this. We, well, I'll talk briefly about it. We've developed this whole thing called exposure with portable reminders. And it's basically this idea that we can extinguish a condition response in a clinic setting, pair reminders, as I said, and then use a server and a mobile platform to provide in real time the reminder to try to kind of have generalization of learning. This, uh, this project I'm going to briefly talk about is uh, a project that is a pilot project from the Duke Translational Research Institute, the DTRI, which funded this. And it really comes from a parent project from NIMH that we are winding down. It's a complicated parent project, so I'll try to keep your attention and make it uh, uh, simple by just focusing on the pilot here that I'll talk about. There's three groups. We have an HR group. The HR group, HR means habituation reminder. HR is habituation reminder. What that means is essentially, once you've calmed down, you've habituated, once your arousal has calmed down in response to a trigger, we're going to call that habituation. And the prompt we're going to use is the reminder of habituation, which it turns out is just an automatic, it's a noise that we made up that sounds a little bit like beep, boop, boop. Uh, and that's really embarrassing to say. Uh, but I do it each time I talk about this, and I'm exposing myself to that. So. What we do is we're going to have people, we're going to have people um, be exposed to autobiographical stressors, so real-world stressors that they experience. They're going to talk about them. They're going to be recorded. They're then going to come back in and hear these stressors in a, in a protocol-driven way. And their arousal is going to go up. And then as they sit there in silence for a few minutes, their arousal is going to come down, as naturally would happen. And we have them hooked up to electrodes and heart rate, and we're using self-report. Uh, standard measures. So we can look over time at this arousal slope up and down. Okay, and when it goes down, group one gets this beep, boop, boop noise. And then group two, they're not going to get that. They're going to end up getting what's called sham sounds, which is just a percussive noise. 
So we also then have a, a third group, which is, which is going to be a self-initiating, the use of hearing the HRs over three days. So I gotta do this quickly. The idea here is, these are our subjects, 18 to 55. These are outpatient psychiatric patients. This is, this is a transdiagnostic group of anxious and depressed adults that are highly emotionally dysregulated, okay? So this is not a healthy sample, psychiatrically. This is what I just described to you as the experimental design, sitting, baseline, stressor, habituation, uh, and then hearing the HR. Here's an example of a stressor that you can pick your own. If you just imagine anything in the past week for you that's been moderately stressful, it would be up there. And you'd be hearing somebody else say it as you sit there in the lab and you listen to it, and your arousal would go up. This is the details of the habituation sequence, if you're curious, so they kind of hear it multiple times in order to have repeated learning occur to the reminder. They come back in a week later, and then that, this is where we're testing whether, they, uh, whether hearing the reminder functions to reduce their arousal in the lab. But for this talk, we're talking about mobile and out of the lab. So out of the lab, then they have three days where uh, they are going to be using this GPS device here, as well as the Zephyr BioHarness for ambulatory psychophysiological recording. And they're using uh, their own uh, mobile phones to indicate uh, their arousal, their distress, and their valence of emotion before and after they get uh, automated calls multiple times a day, as well as in group three, they can call in on their own if they choose to. Clear as mud, I'm sure. So this is more of who we have, uh, primarily female, Caucasian. And here's just an example of some of the data. And so what, what we're trying to do with this, all we're trying to do is we're trying to say, if we give an outpatient psychiatric sample, if we, if we have them using this ambulatory psychophysiological recording for three days while tracking on their phone using an automated prompt platform, uh, will they actually, when they're distressed and hear the reminder sounds, compared to these sham sounds they've never heard before, will they report differences on the phone using keypad? Will they report differences in their distress, which is SUDS, subjective units of psychological distress? Does that go up or does that go down during the call? Just in that two minute phone call, automated, IVR type of call. Uh, does their arousal go up or down? And does their valence of their emotion, which is essentially how pleasant or how unpleasant do you feel in this moment? Okay, so this is the question. We ask arousal, distress, and valence questions at the very beginning of the call. They either hear the, they either hear the HR or they hear the sham sound, depending on which group they're in. And then at the end of the call, they hear the same questions as they did at the beginning. And so we're just simply looking at, does this matter? Will they do it? Do they go running and screaming? Is this possible at all with an outpatient, really distressed psychiatric sample? And you can see, just this, this is not a study powered for statistical significance. It's a pilot study. You can see that distress, arousal, and valence kind of go in the direction you would hope. And you do see that there just does seem to be this kind of emerging pattern, at least numerically, of the HR looks like it's reducing distress uh, numerically, not statistically, but numerically, in a different way than the sham, which is really the control. And the heart rate bar, you see the error bars. This is with a small sample, and you use ambulatory heart rate. You're in trouble. You're not going to. You're going to see all sorts of variability. We can come back to that in the discussion if you like. So the bottom line, kind of take-home point for this talk is that you can do this with this with this kind of a patient sample. Um, you can do. Uh, kind of a repeated three days, very, it's eight times a day, uh, automated calls. Uh, the group three people called in, they all called in to hear their reminder. So this is just sort of a beginning step to show that we, it's feasible to, to do this. Uh, and we also asked people to press their GPS logger to indicate where they were, so we could start to see where in space are we seeing generalization of the change in emotional arousal and the change in distress. Right? So if they're getting distressed, this is just showing that it's acceptable. If we're looking at the GPS data and we're saying, well, where are they in, when they're having changes in distress? This just visually shows you that we're demonstrating, you can objectively demonstrate changes in emotion regulation spatially uh, using this kind of a, a mapping approach. And you can see here, just it's complicated, but you can kind of see the, the pattern. Again, big picture question, how do you generalize learning and how do you document you can do that? if you're doing treatment for psychiatric patients. This shows that you can actually see physically in space where there are different, uh, different changes. And here's another one. When patients called in, you can see the different colors indicate their distress up or their distress down. 
and it's hard to make out the map, but there's Cary and Raleigh and Durham and Roxburgh and so on, and each line is just a different one of the three patients. So we think that this shows the beginnings of feasibility, uh, and we hope to do more, and I will stop there. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Zach. We've seen a lot of uh, varied and innovative approaches to delivering our interventions out in the real world. Um, we're going to keep all of our speakers up here, and now's the time when we can have a panel discussion. Um, questions for our panel about um, not only what they've done, but what some of the challenges were in, in um, developing these technologies. Um, so, questions? Yeah. That was great. That was a really nice overview of a bunch of different things. I know where it starts. So, Eric, I saw on one of your on the fuzzy slides that the last thing was, and then we send this data to the electronic health record. But then you didn't say anything about that. We, so, we can, um, that's actually, we can send data uh, to coaches who can access our dashboard. And those coaches that we worked with in previous studies have been housed within a community health center setting. So they have access to the EHR, so sort of pre-EHR integration, pre-automated EHR integration, right? They can see sort of a blurb that would go to the doc, and they, the doctor, the provider, and they can take that blurb and just copy and paste it from our dashboard below oh, the EHR. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. EHR integration has proven to be quite difficult. Um, so we sort of, in these smaller studies, you know, trying to get a sense of whether or not Go ahead. <laughs> I, I enjoyed everybody's talk with me and the, of course, the recency situation. You're just in my mind right now. Um, I'm in your head. You're in my head. <laughs> uh, you also have some of the same references on your slides that I have on mine, so I don't have to use my thought anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about what you think you might do in the future with um, the heat map of where people do and don't. Um, the heat map so, of, yeah, so where people do and don't change their emotion. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, what do you do with the heat map? How well can you do with that? So um, it's a great question. We've talked about that a lot. Of so um, the short answer is, Conceptual level, the idea is to have some as close to as possible objective measurement of demonstrating generalization of learning. And so being able to simply quantify that there are multiple places in time and space where we see learning occurring, where learning is simply doesn't, I'm interested in emotion and emotional regulation, but really you could do something similar if you're interested in impulse control, attentional, what have you. Yeah. yeah. So, so the idea might be that one way you could use this in research is to be able to document generalization of learning in the real world, which I think is quite important and is really uh, not something that's been demonstrated a lot in research. It's also in the lab, right? Um, in terms of clinical care, it gets a little interesting to think about how you use heat maps to try to provide that information to patients as a way to demonstrate uh, or to provide feedback. Great. Um, other questions, thoughts? I, I wanted to ask you, Bernard, what's been your initial experience, and, and Erica, what's been your initial experience with um, parents responding to the prompts? Um, do they like receiving the, the birthday messages? Has it increased retention in the, the cohort? Well, we, uh, yeah, we don't know exactly. Just how the first sort of process of rolling it out. And I think you have about five, ten subjects now that are concerned. So that was a big, you know, making 
making sure that they understood where their data was going. We have to consent them to that. They have to understand that um, we are using commercial vendors like Twilio and other kinds of, uh, of products that help us engage, that, that help us with this conscious system. So we have to go through a lot of work to establish that. So we won't really know if it improves like our adherence or if it improves our uh, attention and cohort for some time. But I think, you know, in general, participants, they're savvy to it. They have no problem consenting to it. Everybody that we're told about the study is like, yeah, sure, you want to send that. You know, we tell them we're not going to be sending them text all the time. We're not going to overburden them. We're going to see about 12 to 12, 15 texts over the year. not going to turn to major. So we're not, this is not an intervention for them. This is just to help them uh, keep, keep them maintained. Great. Uh, yes, Lavinia. Yeah. This is a question for Ryan. Um, so in your study, I really like the fact that you look at patients with choice of different devices. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more in terms of what their experience has been in terms of the use of multiple devices for the same patient, both from a perspective of maintaining the technology, but also from the perspective of data integration as well. Yeah. So All right, excellent. Uh, this was a great panel. Um, we have to move on, though. I'm sure all of the speakers would be uh, happy to talk more about their work um, at a break or after the conference or by email later. Um, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.